Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, if I understand correctly, then last week you were able to celebrate the gift of the Lord's Supper. The Lord Jesus called you forward to come to the table here. He wanted to have a time of communion with you, and he wanted to assure you that your sins really were forgiven. But then sometimes it happens to us that we're not sure how we're supposed to approach the Lord's Supper. Have you ever had that, that you wonder about that with yourself? Maybe you wonder to yourself, am I supposed to be happy or am I supposed to be sad about this? Am I allowed to smile or am I supposed to look all serious? And other times we don't even get that far in our thinking because we're distracted by other people or we wonder what other people think of us. But the real question is, what does God really want of us in this occasion? What's he doing here at the Lord's Supper? Well, to understand how God wishes us to celebrate the Lord's Supper, it's important for us to understand what's going on when we come to the table. We're going to look at this matter by considering the following theme. I really want to summarize the biblical teaching here. Under this theme, the Lord encourages us in our faith by reminding us of the communion we have with him in the Lord's Supper. And we're going to see in the first place the need for this communion, and secondly, the gift of this communion. So first, the need. What's the Lord's Supper about? Well, you all know very well, it's a sign and seal from God that we share in the forgiveness of our sins. And then we, we also know that prior to coming to the table, the first thing we need to do is we need to examine our own hearts. We need to consider our sins and humble ourselves before God. The only way that coming to the table is a blessing is if you really recognize your sin, if you also bring those things before the Lord, you humble yourself before God because of those sins, then you really need to trust that God will forgive those sins for the sake of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe I could ask you, did you do that prior to coming to the table last week, brothers and sisters? Did you make an honest evaluation of your life, about how you're doing and, and where you stand before the Lord and did you consider your sins before God? It's really important for us to do that. Maybe if I could just be really practical here. When I had the opportunity to preach a sermon in Southern River, then just prior to that, I was preaching through the book of 1 Peter. And in 1 Peter, the Lord is, is really clear in what way we ought to live in fellowship with him. He also pointed out quite a number of sins that the people were struggling with, those who had been dispersed throughout Asia Minor. So in 1 Peter there, the Lord called his people to live as pilgrims in the world instead of getting absorbed into it. God really says, I don't want you to live like the people of the world. Don't get wrapped up in the things of this world. But remember that your citizenship is in heaven. And it's in this context that he also called the people not to get caught up in pursuing the sinful desires of their hearts. They need to put sin away from them. Well, did you do that prior to coming to the Lord's Supper? Did you ask God to forgive you for not living out of the hope of the eternity that's in store for you? In 1 Peter, one of the key themes there is that God tells us that he brings trials into our life in order to bring us to a maturity of faith. Well, did you repent of the way that you sometimes get angry with God or you're unhappy with God because of the trials that he brings in your life? A little later in 1 Peter, we're called to submit to those who are in authority over us, even when they are not really kind or gentle in the way that they handle their authority. Now, did you ask yourself, have I ever rebelled against authority? And have I turned away from that lifestyle? A little later in 1 Peter, the wives are called to submit to their husbands, and husbands are called to be considerate of their wives. You know, you wives, did you... Did you live in submission to your husband? Or did you ask God to forgive you for the times you didn't? And husbands, did you live in a considerate way with your wives? Did you ask God to forgive you for the times you never did that? The point, brothers and sisters, is that we need to be honest about our sins. We need to face the fact that we've done evil. We need to admit that to the Lord. 
That's a very hard thing for us to do. By nature, we don't, we don't easily go there. Our natural reaction is to justify it. Sometimes we, we think, well, I'm no different from anybody else. Or other times we minimize our sins. We say, well, at least I didn't do what he did. Do you know, do you know what he did? Do you know what kind of things happened to him? Or other times we rationalize our sins. We say, well, I had no other choice. If you were in my situation, you wouldn't have done anything different. But the Lord wants us to consider our sins and accursedness, to detest ourselves, and to humble ourselves before him. He wants us to listen to him so that we're really cut to the heart, that we admit what we've done wrong, that we acknowledge that we often make a mess out of our lives. And if we're honest about this, then you see the way that's happened in the course of your life. It's really David in Psalm 25, he talks about that. As we mature in faith and we can look back in our lives, we can see how deeply we've sinned in the past. The closer you grow with God, the more you know God, the more you walk in a relationship with your Savior, then the more you get to see what sin really is. You understand how badly you sin before God. David prayed in Psalm 25, Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindnesses, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to your mercy, remember me, for your goodness sake, O Lord. It's when you get to this place, brothers and sisters, that you can humble yourself before the Lord because of your sin. True repentance means that you, that you come clean. David in Psalm 51, we just sang it, he comes clean before God. Nathan confronted him, and he said, yes, Lord, that is the truth of my life. Against you, you and you only have I sinned. And he asked God to forgive him. He acknowledged he was guilty of adultery and of bloodshed. He was aware that he grieved the Holy Spirit, and he pleaded with God that the Holy Spirit would stay with him. The most important thing is that he asked God that he would have a clean heart once again, that he have this renewed spirit. Well, there's a lot in us that resists going to that place, brothers and sisters. We're too proud to open the door. We don't want to acknowledge that we're really that bad. And so our Father helps us with that. He confronts us with the faithful proclamation of the gospel. It's when we hear the word, it's when we read his word, that we understand ourselves, where we are, and how we stand before him. And alongside of that, he puts people in our lives who admonish us so we can't pretend anymore. And then he powerfully works in our hearts through his Holy Spirit so that we're convicted of our sins and we really do humble ourselves before him and we come clean with him. And it's really kind that God does this for us, brothers and sisters. Because it's when, it's in your, this, when you're in this place that the, Holy, that the Holy Supper becomes very meaningful to you. The whole point of the Lord's Supper is to encourage those who honestly face up to their sins that you have a Savior and that God will forgive you and he will take care of you. Christ has come to redeem you from your sins and to reconcile you to your Father. If your sin is meaningless, if it doesn't really bother you, and you shouldn't be surprised if the Lord's Supper is also a rather meaningless affair. But if you're aware of your sins, if you're aware of God's grace, then the Lord's Supper becomes this very special time in your life. Our Lord gives us his supper to feed our souls. That's the language of the confession here. It's in answer 79 we confess that God wants to teach us by his supper that as bread and wine sustain us in this temporal life, so his crucified body and shed blood are true food and drink for our souls to eternal life. And so God picks up here in a really normal image. Every single day, we eat and we drink. Most of us rather enjoy eating and drinking. We have a lot of pleasure in the food that we get. Not a day goes by that you don't eat it and drink. In the same way, God says we need to feed our souls to be strengthened to eternal life. Your soul needs to be nourished in the same way that your body needs to be nourished. You know, we understand if you don't eat, then 
by three o'clock or four o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to get really weak and you're not going to have the energy. You're going to get really hungry and it's not going to go well for you. Well, that same principle, God says, applies to your spiritual life. You need to feed your soul. Your soul needs to be nourished. Well, do you regularly do that for your, your souls, brothers and sisters? Do you feed your soul so that you are at peace and at rest? That you have the assurance of faith, the joy of the Lord, and hope for eternal life? You know, you think of that image of, of feeding your soul, and then you can wonder to yourself, well, what do I feed my soul? The Bible teaches you that the way to nourish your soul is by having fellowship with Christ. It's when you have communion with the Lord Jesus that God gives you the assurance of the forgiveness of your sins. That God assures you that you're at peace with God, that you share in life with him, that you have a relationship with him, and that that relationship is going to go on for all eternity. You know, sometimes what happens to us is we get caught up in, in the normal affairs of daily life. We get wrapped up in the here and now. And sometimes, many times, things don't go well for us. There's all sorts of trouble that we have in our lives. Or you end up looking around you, you look at the world around you, and you see all this distress. You see all this brokenness in the world in which we live. And most people around us, they become cynical. They become despairing. They don't have hope for the future. Well, it's easy to get wrapped up in that. It's easy to get caught up in the daily concerns of everyday life to get caught up in the brokenness all around you. It's in this context that God really wants to feed your soul and to give you an assurance that he has you in his hands, that he cares for you, that he's gonna look after you. And obviously the first way we do that is through the word of God. It's when the scriptures comes to us and when we take it to heart that our soul is nourished and fed. But then Christ also teaches us that we can have communion with him, we can nourish our souls by attending the Lord's Supper. The fact is that when you eat a meal with someone, then you have fellowship with them. You all know that, brothers and sisters. Sometimes you have a conversation with a person, maybe you meet somebody at work, or maybe you talk on the phone with someone, or maybe you text somebody. You have a certain level of communion with them, but it's very different if you invite your coworker over to your home and you say, well, why don't you come to my place and we'll have a meal together? It's a very intimate level of sharing with that person. Well, God makes the same point in our reading from 1 Corinthians 10. He warns his people there against going along with Gentiles when they offer food to idols. And he says, yes, it's true, an idol is nothing. But he says, you need to realize that behind idols stand demons. So in reality, he says, those Gentiles are offering food to demons. They're having fellowship with demons. And God says, this is my people. He says, you can never go along with that. So 1 Corinthians 10, verse 19, what am I saying then? Is an idol anything? Or what is offered to an idol is anything? Rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake in the Lord's table and the table of demons. If you go along with the Gentiles, with the unbelievers, if you partake in their festivals, if you go ahead and eat food that has been sacrificed to demons, then you're having fellowship with them. Eating a meal means you have communion with that person. Well, God's saying instead of having communion with demons, you're invited to come and have communion with me. And again, the way he expresses that is through a meal, through the Lord's Supper. It's at the Lord's Supper that we actually have fellowship with Jesus Christ. Last week when you sat down at the table here, you shared in the crucified body and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. It's a teaching that comes to us in John 6. Our Lord Jesus Christ teaches us there that sharing in his body and blood is essential for nourishing our souls. It's a passage where Christ first called himself the bread of life. And what he does there is he, he first compares himself to the bread that the believers ate in the Old Testament when they ate the special bread that came down from heaven, the manna. The manna. 
Well, he said that was supernatural food that came from God. But even though it was supernatural food, it didn't lead to life for those who ate it. Those who ate the manna still died in the wilderness. But then he said, it's different if you eat my flesh. It's in John 8, verse 51 that he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Now, if you remember the passage in John 8, you'll remember that the people who heard this had a really hard time accepting it. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? You can understand the concern. But Christ responds, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. So Christ is saying, if you come to the Lord's Supper, you sit down at the table, you eat of the bread, you drink of the cup, you are eating and drinking of his body and blood. You have fellowship with him then Christ abides in you, and you abide in him. He is food to you. Not physically. That's the point that our confession makes here. It's not as if we're eating human flesh or drinking human blood when we eat and drink the Lord's Supper. That's question and answer 78. Our confession is really clear here. Just as the water of baptism doesn't change into the blood of Christ, so the bread of the Lord's Supper does not become Christ's body just call the body because that's the way sacraments work. Sometimes I use the, the example of a gift certificate to try to explain that to my catechism students. If you get a gift card, say to Bunnings or to the Dome, it says $50 on it. And that gift card, it's worth $50. If you go to Bunnings and you hand in the card, you can buy $50 worth of merchandise, and you walk out of the store, you give them the, that card, and it's as if you're giving them real money. It even actually says on the back, it, it warns you, this card should be treated like cash. Well, it's not a $50 bill, but it is worth $50. If you actually lose it one day, you might say to your friend, well, I'm just really sad because I lost 50 bucks. Well, here at the sacrament, it's, it's a similar thing. You don't actually eat the the physical body, the physical blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's through faith that you share in Christ and that you partake in Christ. You have fellowship with him. When you eat, then through faith, he abides in you and you in him. It's through sharing in the Lord's Supper that we can be sure that he lives in us. We can be assured that we really are his children. And the reason God wants you to know that, brothers and sisters, is because on a really deep level, he wants to make sure that you understand that he's not angry with you because of your sins. Now, I said a minute, minute ago, it's, it's often really scary to admit your sins. When you're honest about your sin, then you make yourself really vulnerable before the Lord. But God wants you to do that. He wants you to become vulnerable. And as soon as you become vulnerable, then he invites you into his presence and he says, I want you to know for sure that I really do forgive your sins. Take, eat this bread and drink this cup and be assured that Christ's body has been shed for you and his blood has been poured out for you. I want you to know deep in your heart that he loves you and that he will forgive you for everything that you've done wrong. It's important for us to, to bear that in mind, brothers and sisters. We know the Lord as a just God. And particularly as Reformed people, we, we don't gloss over sin we don't gloss over the holiness of God or, or punishment. You know, a few minutes ago, we just read from 1 Corinthians 10. It talks there about the judgment of God that comes down on the Israelites. Some of the people there were sinful. They engaged in sexual immorality with the Moabites. The result is that God put 23,000 of those people to death. Or a little later, we're told that God again punished them because of their grumbling, their complaining, their lack of faith in him. 
And so we understand that sin leads to punishment. God's justice demands that those who sin will be punished for it. But the good news that God wants to assure you of is that you don't have to make the payment for your own sins. Jesus Christ has come to die on the cross for you. And if you believe in Jesus as your Savior, then Christ will take that punishment upon himself. Now, we also know that, brothers and sisters. Many of us, in a really deep way, we know that God is a forgiving God, that God will not hold our sins against us, but he'll show us his mercy and his compassion. But then there are times where we still wonder. If you commit a really serious sin, you do something that's grievously wrong in the presence of the Lord, and sometimes you can wonder. I've had people sit in my study and say to me, you know, Reverend, if you really knew what I did, that you wouldn't think that I'm a child of the Lord. Or other times it happens to people that you get caught in the same sin. And it happens over and over and over again. And you hate yourself for it. And you fight against it. And you do whatever you can to get away from it. And yet you still find that you commit these same sins. Well, it's for these reasons that the Lord gives the Holy Supper. It is true that you are a sinner. And it is true that you deserve wrath. But your father wishes to comfort you. He wants to assure you that he won't deal with you according to his anger. He wants to nourish your soul by reminding you that Christ has paid for all your sins. The point of the Lord's Supper is to remind you of God's love. The Lord is a loving God. That's the foundational characteristic that he reveals of himself. When he shows himself to be the Lord, the Lord, then he tells Moses that he is the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. It doesn't mean he excuses sin, but it does tell us the foundational part of his character. And so when you ate and drank the wine last week, you were joined and united to Christ. You had fellowship with him. Christ invites you to the table to nourish your souls, to make sure you understand that you get to share in the eternal life that he's prepared for his people. It's when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, that what happens is the focus is no longer on us. It's not on who we are and what we do and how we live. But the focus is on our Lord Jesus, who he is and what he has done and how he has lived with the Father. And it's as we focus our attention on our Savior Jesus Christ that we can have this assurance in our soul. And so if you see it from that perspective, brothers and sisters, then the Lord's Supper is a very special time. Before we come to the table, we really need to humble ourselves before God, and we need to have a genuine sorrow for our sins. But then when we come to the table, the whole point is to remind and assure us of God's love towards us. Our sins have been paid for. The shame has been taken away. We are not guilty in the sight of our Father anymore. Instead, God wants us to have a real joy and a deep gratitude in our hearts that he is our God who loves us and will care for us, and that at the end of time, he will invite us into his presence to share in the joy that he gives to his people. Amen.